you got the bunch, don't worry about okay. it. Okay. Yeah, we got a yeah. few things. So. Good, don't worry about okay. it. Okay. Thanks. It's a way to know that, that this is working. So it should be, though. Okay. Good morning. Hello, Medina Community Church family. Good to see everybody. We um, have some exciting things going on uh, both today and, and throughout this coming week I wanted to share with you. Uh, one of the things is uh, one of my favorite Sundays is fourth Sunday of every month is Feast and Fellowship. And uh, this afternoon, right, right after the service over in the fellowship hall, which is just to my left, um, the ladies are back there and, and uh, have a lot of food prepared for us. Uh, this week is, uh, um, or this month is fiesta themed. And so we have a lot of uh, Mexican dishes. And uh, as some of y'all know, Kathleen, I just got back from Mexico. And so if you need any help, um, you know, taste testing your food, I'll be happy to tell you whether it's authentic or not. <laughs> But um, fortunately, I had Kathleen as my interpreter on the trip most of the time, so I didn't get into too much trouble. But I uh, also want to let you know, if you're interested in joining our church, we have a new members class that's set for May 7th. So that's two Sundays from now. We're going to be talking about where our church has come from, what do we believe, how are we governed, and then how you can be involved. And so that's going to be May 7th. It'll be in the fellowship hall after the church service and lunch will be provided. If you're interested in that, please see Sherry Lucas um, or call or text the church and we'll get your name um, on the list. We'd love to see you there. Also uh, tonight at seven o'clock at the core is going to be what we call hymn sing and uh, Ada is going to be leading that and it's going to be a time of worship using hymns. And so you won't want to miss that tonight, seven o'clock at the core. Vacation Bible School is coming up, and Lacey's going to tell us about that. Okay, I think I'm going to start calling these interactive announcements by Lacey Rogers. Last time I had you yell back at me, this time, next time I may do the hokey pokey, I'm not sure. This time I'll have you raise your hands. Okay, so how many people you want to further the kingdom of God? Raise your hand. Okay. So how many people think that a kid coming to Vacation Bible School and unchurched, I really want to reach the unchurched in our community this year. We're gonna, I've got a couple ideas and we're going to go after those. But how many people think that a kid coming to Vacation Bible School can go home and their entire family can be saved? Okay. How many people, if I told you, um, that I could use you in vacation Bible school no matter your skill, no matter if you like children, if you don't, if you, whatever it is. If I could figure out a way to use you and knowing that this is a way to further the kingdom of God, how many would volunteer to help in vacation Bible school this year? If I can find your skill, that's not as many hands as I thought. Steve Swat, okay. Okay. If you can tell, if you can bake, if you can glue cardboard to a poster board, if you can, whatever it is, let's do that again. Okay, if I could figure out a way to involve you in Bible school this year, how many would say yes? Okay, I'm going to be talking to all of you. Wait, wait, wait. I, I, I don't know if you guys can realize, but we can see you. <laughs> So, so ask that question again one more time. Okay. How many people, no matter your skill set, will help with vacation Bible school and bring in the harvest? I mean, let's think about it. The kids are ripe for harvest. How many people are going to help with vacation Bible school? Okay. All right. So in about two weeks, I'm going to have a table outside, and I'm going to sign people up. If you see me, find me. I'm going to write down your name and your phone number and your skill set. And I want you to be a part of Vacation Bible School this year. And it doesn't mean you have to be here during the week, but I'm going to have things beforehand for people to do as well. 
So thank you for your participant. Heidi, I think that's more volunteers than we've had in the history of Vacation Bible School. All right, thank you for that, Lacey. Uh, my name is Bill Stegmiller, and I'm the pastor here, and I just want to welcome everyone, and uh, I'm excited for what the Lord is doing. Just a couple of brief things before we begin our worship together. I want you to uh, notice inside your bulletin, we've talked about this many times before, there's an insert, and uh, this is some of the needs of the church. And I just encourage you not to throw this away, take it home. Put it in your vehicle so that you can pray on the way to wherever. Put it on your refrigerator. I started stapling inside my uh, prayer journal so that I have a record week to week. And different weeks, different things on this list pop out at me. Uh, this week, the grieving. Uh, we had a memorial service for Laverne McWilliams and this church really put their best foot forward, showed a lot of love. Marshall was here, and he was just overwhelmed by the love he was shown by this church and everything that went into it. And we'll make sure to uh, put his letter in the next upcoming e-note. But uh, keep in mind, those that are grieving, those who are in nursing home facilities or rehab centers, uh, keep in mind uh, the addict and the alcoholic, uh, those in prison and those in jail, those fighting cancer. You know, we've had uh, Jason Poorman on our list a long time. Chula, uh, keep keep it up, right? He's he's doing better, so that's good news. Also, uh, Logan Sides has been on a lot of people's hearts as well. Uh, we need to keep him. How old is Logan? Twelve years old. And, and this is just me. These are some of the things that really popped out for me, uh, different things. The cool thing about the body of Christ, I think we can cover this whole list as you ask the Lord what uh, you need to be praying about. So uh, please, please take this very, very seriously. Also, there are these blue cards inside your pews. This is a great way to reach people for Christ. You can give it to people. Uh, you're at a restaurant, leave a big tip, okay? And with this card, say, hey, we have... Um, a website, if you scan this QR code on the back, it will answer uh, some of life's biggest questions, and there's an invitation from our pastor. It's a great, non-threatening way to reach people for Jesus Christ. So those are some of the things I have. Um, you have a calendar of upcoming events inside your bulletin. Please make, make note of that. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready to worship. How about you? So I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up. As we uh, pray, opening up this time together, let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that you're in the house. Yes. And we just want to exalt your name, let you be the focal point of everything that happens, not just in our, in our lives, but in the life of this church. We thank you that it's your church, that you're the one who builds it, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And Lord, we just want to... Also, use this as a place where we can encourage one another and build one another up, as well as open our hearts for whatever you want to pour into it. Um, hear our hearts, Lord. We want to be like you in every sense of the word. So help us, Lord. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And all the people said, amen. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So love the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gates that all may come in. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the earth. 
purchase of blood to every believer the promise of God the vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus
because you're good. You're so good, Father. You're so good. We thank you that you're here in this place. We thank you that we are covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So when you look on us, that's what you see, his righteousness. We thank you that Jesus freed us from sin and death. And Lord, we're so looking forward to being in heaven with you. Lord, we thank you for the promises of your word. And your promises are yes and amen. We thank you for the freedom in Christ. And Lord, there are so many that are sick, that are fighting cancer, 
that are struggling through dementia and Alzheimer's and, and all kinds of diseases. And so, Lord, we thank you that you're in that with them, that you're walking through that. And Lord, we do pray healing. We thank you for your healing because you are the great physician. And you're the same God today as you were yesterday. So you still heal today. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. But we know, too, that as we walk through the valleys of the shadow of death, that we shall fear no evil, for you are with us. So you are with each of them that are, that are going through terrible circumstances, things that are so awful, that are so overwhelming. But we have such hope because we know we don't have to walk alone. So, Lord, we thank you for people. In, the li- in our lives that can come alongside and say exactly what we need. And, Lord, we want to be that kind of people to each other, that kind of family. So, Lord, we w- help us to encourage one another, to walk alongside one another, to sit in the middle of each other's messes and just be there and be silent. So, Lord, we just thank you for what you're doing. And, Lord, it's not too early to start praying for Vacation Bible School, to start praying for all the camps around here. So, Lord, we know that you're going to do something great this year. And we just thank you, and we want to partner with you, and we just want to say, yes, Lord, your will be done. The harvest is ripe. And, Lord, we pray for more workers. Pray for, we just want to be surrendered to you, Father. So wherever you're calling us, we want our answer to be yes. So, Lord, we just thank you for being so good. In Jesus' name, amen. God, I... I went all over the place during that prayer time. I found myself just hurting for those that are hurting. And then I found myself just wanting to thank God for his goodness. How about that rain we had? He is so good. Let's go ahead and pray for this time together. Lord, we're grateful that... uh, We have your word and that you want to speak to us. And we thank you that we also have the word that was made flesh. And Lord, our deepest prayer as we have this time together in your word is that we will get to know that word made flesh better and become more like him. So we pray all this in Jesus' name and all the people said, Amen. amen. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I encourage you to turn to Acts chapter 4. We're going to look at Acts chapter 4 beginning with verse 32. Many of you know that we study the Bible book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, even word by word because we believe every bit of it is holy and inspired. And just to kind of bring us back up to, hey, Lewis, it's good to see you. I I have ADD. I'm just... uh, How was that motorcycle trip? Good, good. What was I talking about? Verse by verse. Verse by verse. Uh, Let me remind you of where we've been. The church at this time is still in its infancy. Acts chapter 2, we see the church being empowered by the Holy Spirit and Peter preaching the first sermon after Pentecost. And it's amazing, 3,000 people believe the gospel and are baptized. And by the way, if you believe in Jesus Christ and you have not been baptized, the third Sunday in May is Baptism Sunday. We'd love to get you on that list and baptize you. But in a single day, the church went from 120 people to over 3,000 people. And then in the next chapter, we see the church being introduced to persecution And you would think the numbers would go down, but they only increased. Uh, Peter and John were on their way to the temple to pray, and they encounter a man that was born lame, and, and they healed him, right, in Jesus' name. And this was quite a miracle. Uh, thousands of people gathered around them in the temple, and Peter used that as an opportunity to talk about Jesus. And he and John were arrested and dragged out of that temple, but not before 5,000 
men, not talking about women and children, just 5,000 men believed. So the number of the church was probably in excess of 10,000 people in just a few days, right? And the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at Acts chapter 4, the church on trial. Peter and John are brought before the Jewish Sanhedrin, the very council that Jesus stood before. And they demand, by what power and name have you done this, this miracle of healing this guy? And Peter says, Jesus. And he goes so far as to say, this Jesus whom you crucified is now alive. And the Sanhedrin marveled at these guys because they were common, ordinary, everyday men, uneducated, untrained. And yet here's the game changer. They recognized that they had been with Jesus. And they tried to threaten them some more. And basically what happens, Peter says, you do what you have to do. We'll do what we have to do. We're not going to stop talking about Jesus. It's really incredible when you look at that story. And then last week, we looked at the church in prayer. Peter and John report to the church, and together the church goes to the Lord in prayer. And it's amazing what they do not pray. They do not pray, Lord, get us out of this mess. They don't pray, Lord, protect us. In fact, you know what they pray? For more boldness. The very thing that got them in trouble in the first place. They pray for more of that. How do you stop a church like that? You can't. That's what made the church so unstoppable. And then we come to this morning's passage. And originally, in, inside your bulletin, you might notice that the title is Godly Generosity versus Deadly Hypocrisy. And uh, I thought I could get into chapter 5. Sherry, you're right. There's no way. Um, but I also got to confess that I try to do exegesis when I study God's word. In other words, let the meaning of the text come out, uh, led by the Holy Spirit. And I found myself getting nowhere this week because I was doing the opposite. I was doing isogesis. I had an agenda with God's word. And really looking at the text this morning, it's really all about biblical unity. We're going to be talking about godly generosity, which is a part of biblical unity. But the main idea in this passage is biblical unity. And I've been in ministry for over 30 years. You would think I would know to do exegesis, but it just goes to show we can all kind of stumble and fall. And, well, thank God for his grace, right? So we're going to look at biblical unity. Before we do, though, when you look at God's word, there are marvelous examples of togetherness, and there are horrible examples of divisiveness. I think of the church in Corinth. That's a church that I would never want to pastor. God would have to give me a burning bush experience for me to go to Corinth because it was ugly and petty, and they fought over little things. In fact, at one point in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, why are you suing one another? They were taking one another to court outside the church. But they were fighting over things that really don't matter. For example, in chapter 1, baptism. I'm not saying baptism is not important, but they were arguing about whose baptism was better. You know, the human agent that was doing the baptizing. Well, I was baptized by this guy. Big deal. I was baptized by that guy. And Paul's like, I thank God I didn't baptize any of you. And then he's like, oh, yeah, I did baptize Crispus and Gaius and the household of Stephanos. But other than that, I can't think of anyone I baptized. But they were fighting over things like that. They were fighting over spiritual gifts. That's the whole context of the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13 that's often recited at weddings. The context is spiritual gifts. Paul's like, I'll show you a more excellent way. In other words, you're fighting about things like tongues. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. It's really all about love. And if that's not enough, the church was also fighting over communion. Who got to be first? And Paul really goes after them. He's like, man, don't you have homes to eat in? When you're gathering, you're gathering for the worse and not the better. In other words, it would be better if you guys didn't even meet than meet with that kind of attitude. And the crazy thing, the crazy thing is that all these things we talked about, baptism, spiritual gifts, communion, were given by God to what? Bring us together. And yet the enemy had a way of dividing the church with those very same things. I've seen churches split over stupid things. 
I used to think it was a joke that churches split over color of the carpet. It happens. Or whether to have pews or chairs. It's just really outrageous. Let me read to you something from Max Lucado from a book. Michael, you ever heard of, where's Michael? You ever heard of Max Lucado? Pretty good guy. Uh, he wrote in the book Gentle Thunder. It's a parable. You know what a parable is? It's a, it's a story that has a spiritual purpose. Max Lucado writes this. Some time ago, I came across a fellow on a trip who was carrying a Bible. Are you a believer? I asked him. Yes, he said excitedly. I learned you can't be too careful. So I asked, virgin birth? I accept it. Deity of Christ? No doubt. Death of Christ on the cross? He died for all people. Could it be that I was face to face with a Christian? Perhaps. Nonetheless, I continued my checklist. <laughs> Status of man? Sinner in need of grace. Definition of grace? God doing for man what man can't do. Return of Christ? Eminent. Bible? Inspired. The church? The body of Christ. I started getting excited. Conservative or liberal? He was getting interested too. Conservative. My heart began to beat faster. Heritage. Get a load of this. Southern Congregationalist, Holy Son of God, Dispensationalist, Triune Convention. That was mine. Branch. Premillennial, post-trib, non-charismatic, King James, one cup communion. My eyes began to mist. I had only one other question. Is your pulpit wooden or fiberglass? Fiberglass, he responded. I withdrew my hand and stiffened my neck. Heretic! And I walked away. It really doesn't take much to start a new congregation. And I found over the years that there are very few things that are really worth fighting over. And by the way, next month we're going to start a new class during the Sunday school hour in the fellowship hall on the essentials. And I found in my experience there are only a few essentials that are really worth fighting over. I could probably list them on one hand. The person and work of Jesus Christ that he really is God, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, that he, he's going to come back again, right? It's pretty important that we agree on that. The Bible, it's not just a book. It's a word of God. It's wholly inspired. It will never lead you wrong. Salvation, it's by grace and not by works. How about a response to salvation? You don't use God's grace as a license to do whatever you want. With the attitude of grace, grace, God's grace, I can sin to my heart's content because it's all covered by grace. No. You use God's grace as an opportunity to serve him with all your heart. Not that we're saved by that, right? Very few things that are really worth fighting over. Pews or chairs? I have my opinion, chairs. But is it going to matter a hundred years from now? That's really the issue. Actually, God has a lot to say about unity. Let me share with you a scripture from Psalm 133, verse 1. We'll put it on the screen. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And it's a short psalm. It actually talks about how it's like oil dripping off your beard, and you got to understand the culture, that was actually a good thing. If you were traveling and someone took you in, they would offer you water to clean your feet and oil to pour on your head. It was refreshing. But I love this verse, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren, that's you and I here this morning, to dwell together in unity. In fact, disunity is something that God actually hates. Every now and then, um, I'll shock people with a prayer, help me to love the things you love and hate the things you hate. And I've had people, more than one over the years, that were like, well, First John says God is love, as if God doesn't hate anything. He hates a lot of things. 
And in Proverbs chapter 6, there are six things the Lord hates, seven things that are an abomination. Just take these in for a moment. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and look at the last one, one who sows discord among brethren. Wow. I don't know about you, but if these are things that the Lord absolutely hates, I want to be sure that I'm not guilty of doing any of those things. And sometimes it's so easy. I've talked about this many times. My sins, my issue, my problems look so much better on Steve than me. So rather than deal with my issues, I'd rather, Steve, deal with your issues. And really, that's what Matthew chapter 6 is all about. Why are you, are you trying to take the speck out of your own eye when you've got a plank in your own eye? First deal with the plank in your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to deal with the speck in your neighbor's eye. But I just want to, can you go back to that scripture for a moment? Proverbs chapter 6. I just want us to take that in. What is the Lord saying to you about these things? We should have the attitude of the psalmist in Psalm 139. Search me, right, and know my heart, Lord. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there is any wicked way in me. So with that in mind, let's look at what the Bible has to say about unity in our passage this morning. Acts chapter 4, beginning with verse 32. Now the multitude, and remember the church at this point was in the thousands the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. That word common in the Greek New Testament is koinonia, from which we get the word fellowship. It's the second time we hear about this in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, we again hear that they had all things in common as they dedicated themselves to the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, the breaking of bread, in prayer. Verse 33 goes on to say, And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace, I love that phrase, great grace was upon them all. Now I feel the need to kind of point out the fact that there are a lot of people who use verses like this in the verse in Acts chapter 2 to justify communism. And what you have to understand, this is nothing like communism. Communism, some people say socialism, which is the same thing, is, is, well, it's demonic. It's humanistic. And as a result, it really doesn't have God in the picture. And it's rather selfish. It's all about me. What you have, I want. And it forcibly takes from one person and gives it to another. Communism says, hey, what's yours? It's mine. It's all me, me, me. My, my, my. What you get the impression when you look at this is they were filled with such great grace that what's mine is yours. This was completely voluntary. Nowhere in this passage is, is it said or even implied that God told them to do all this stuff. They were filled with such great grace that they wanted to, and that's one of the ingredients to unity is godly generosity. You know, one of the reasons we don't pass an offering plate here is we don't want to guilt people to give. We, we don't want to make a person give if they don't want to give. If you want to give, we have offering boxes out there, but we never really ever seriously talk about them. And we don't have them up here because we don't want to make it a show about, well, look, man, someone gave. That's between you and the Lord. But the thing is, when you become in touch with God's grace, how great it is, you realize there's no way you can outgive God. And one of the things that happens, you'll naturally want to be more generous with everything you have with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. But I want you to notice a unifying factor in all this. It's implied in the whole chapter. In fact, the, the passage right before, Peter says, there's no other name under heaven by which men can be saved than Jesus. And right here in verse 33, it says, with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of what? The Lord Jesus. Jesus was the unifying factor. Jesus said, 
I will build my church. It's his church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, we're told to keep the unity of the Spirit. We don't have to manufacture unity. Unity is already there in Christ. Our task is to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, which is an awesome thing. Now, let me quickly tell you what unity is not, because sometimes that helps us understand what unity is really all about. Unity is not uniformity. Do you know what I mean when I say uniformity? Everyone being the same, right? Looking the same, acting the same, dressing the same, talking the same. Uh, unity has nothing to do with uniformity. In fact, this is really interesting. The church at this time was m all Jews. But in Acts chapter 2, we read about how Jews from every nation under heaven were there with different backgrounds and cultures and languages. So the church at this time was very diverse, and I think they were made better as a result. And in a moment, not yet, we're going to put on the screen 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But let me preface it by saying 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about the church as a body with Christ as a head. Made up of many different members in many different parts that serve many different purposes. And how one part can't say to another, I have no need of you. We need one another. And when one part hurts, we all hurt. Go ahead and put the scripture on the screen. This is what Paul says. He says, if the whole body were an eye, verse 17, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? Verse 18, but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, in other words, if we were all the same, where would the body be? Many different parts. I love how Lacey pointed out in Vacation Bible School, we need everyone and their gifts and talents and their passion for the body to be truly complete. Let me tell you what else the the term unity does not mean. It does not mean uniformity. It does not mean, and I almost hate to bring up this word, but I'm going to say it anyway. It does not mean tolerance. Now, it used to be some 30 years ago, tolerance was a good word. It was a virtue. Uh, tolerance carried the idea of, well, you're dealing with someone difficult. You show restraint. That's what it meant to be tolerant. And all of us have that difficult person in your life that's hard to get along with? Or am I the only one? <laughs> Some of you have more than one. In fact, if you're here this morning and you don't have a difficult person in your life, well, chances are, Steve, you're that difficult person. <laughs> Why am I picking on Steve? Uh, ask him what he did to my truck. Let me tell you what tolerance, <laughs> culture has appropriated that word and has changed its meaning. Nowadays, tolerant means to accept, affirm, and even celebrate someone's values that often go contrary to your own. And I think all of us know what I'm talking about, right? It goes contrary to what you own. So if, if you don't believe, for example, that there are multiple genders and that sexuality is fluid, well, you're a hater. And one of the reasons we left the United Methodist Church, I, I kid you not, you can't make up this stuff. We have uh, yearly reports, and one of the last yearly reports um, has the demographics of the congregation, and now it's no longer two genders, male and female. You have non-binary, despite the fact what the Bible says. God made them male and female. Male and female, he created them in the image of God. So unity is, is not unity at any cost. Because the World Council of Churches, anyone familiar with them? They started out with real noble purposes in the 1940s to unite all the churches, all the denominations. And over the years, they began to compromise on various things of the faith. And now the World Council of Churches, I'm not exaggerating one bit, they don't hold to the authority of Scripture. They don't even hold to the exclusivity of Jesus Christ being the only way to God. 
So they water down Christianity to the least common denominator to the point that it does not stand for anything. So unity is not uniformity, it's not tolerance. Let's continue to look at what unity actually is. Verse 34. Luke goes on to say, Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And again, I have to remind you, nowhere does God command them to do this. You know, it could be, and I tend to believe this, the early church really expected Jesus to come back any day. In fact, any hour. They really expected his coming to happen like that. And it could be, and I could be wrong, it could be that they were like, hey, we got to make the most of this time, and they sold what they had, and they pulled it all together so that they could not only take care of one another, but extend the gospel uh, to the furthest reaches. But one thing is for sure, it didn't last. It's a beautiful picture of generosity in the church, and so many of you have that spirit, and I want to celebrate that, but it didn't last. The next chapter, what happens? You have Ananias and Sapphira. Right? And they give with the wrong motive. It was a show and there was hypocrisy. And the chapter after that, Acts chapter 6, the widows were arguing over the daily distribution of food. The Greek Jewish widows felt like they were not get, getting as much as the Hebrew Jewish widows. And they established deacons to kind of oversee the matter. And then when, whether it was Paul and Barnabas or Paul or Silas, when they went out on their missionary trips and started Gentile churches, they actually took Love offerings. Why? To help the poor in Jerusalem. It didn't, it didn't last that long, but it is a beautiful picture. Now, as we begin to wrap this up, I want to introduce you to someone I'm going to call Uncle Barney. Okay? Barnabas. And I don't want to go into too much detail because we're going to compare and contrast him with Ananias and Sapphira. But if you look at verse 36, it says, And Joseph, some of your Bibles say Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles. In other words, he was given this nickname by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. By the way, the way you uh, had wealth back then, they didn't have banks like what we do or or pension funds, or 401ks, or 403bs, or mutual funds, or stocks, or bonds. Uh, the way they retained wealth was land. So he sold his land and gave the proceeds to the church. And someone who's, who's a, a Bible scholar might point out the fact that he was a Levite and he had land. What's up with that? Because according to Jewish law, Levites were not supposed to have land in the nation of Israel. Their inheritance was the Lord. Well, they were in Cyprus. Right? He was from Cyprus. No doubt the land was in Cyprus. He had land. He sold it. But I want to look at his nickname, Barnabas, which means to encourage. He had that kind of reputation. He built people up instead of tore them down. We've talked about all the one another verses in the Bible. Most of them, like 90%, are in the context of the church. We're told to love one another, serve one another, pray for one another. Let me give you two for one. Are you ready for this? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. We're going to end with this. This is not a suggestion. This is actually a command. We're told to encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. That's one of the key factors in biblical unity. When you come together, do you tear people down or do you build them up? Now, I love Deer Creek Camp. One of the things they constant, constantly, we have, where are the Deer Creek people? Did they go to children's church? Okay. Um, they, they have this thing, what time is it, right? If, if, if we slip with our words, if we suddenly talk about someone instead of to them, <laughs> you're supposed to move up alongside Steve and say, what time is it? And it's a mental cue. It's supposed to remind you of, of Ephesians 4.29 that says, Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth except that which is necessary for edification. 
for encouragement, that it may provide grace to those who hear it. Let me ask you a question. All of us here, young and old, rich and poor, everyone here, you ready for this? Are you? This is interactive, Lacey, so are you ready for this? You're not raising your hand. Yeah, okay. Should I preach to Lacey? (laughs) What would this church look like if everyone here was absolutely intentional about encouraging and building up one another with their words instead of tearing them down belittling them, shaming them. I've often said this is a no shame zone. What would this place look like if everyone took this verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 seriously? That we were absolutely intentional about encouraging and building one another up. We couldn't we we couldn't fit enough people. It it would just it'd be incredible. And that's my prayer for us. And I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir. Many of you do that. But maybe there's some people who don't. And maybe this is a wake-up call. So what have we talked about so far? Unity, biblical unity is pleasing to the Lord. How good it is for the brothers to dwell in unity. In fact, God hates disunity. We talked about what unity is not. It's not uniformity. Thank God for that. It's not tolerance. Biblical unity is is being filled with such great grace that you can't help but give to one another, not because you have to, but because you want to. And you're intentional about building one another up and encouraging them instead of tearing them down. Amen? Let's stand up and we'll pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. It is living. It is active, as Hebrews 4 says. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it's able to get down deep in areas nothing else can. And we thank you that you're the master surgeon. You're able to reach into our life and deal with the real issues we need to deal with. And, Lord, we want to live a life pleasing to you. We realize we can't earn our salvation, but we want to respond to that grace. We want to be sensitive to the things that cause you pain, the things you hate. We want to cultivate a spirit of unity that's rooted in Christ. Thank God we're not all the same. Thank God for that. So help us, Lord. Help us to be more like you. Help us to really function like a body so that when one part hurts, we all hurt. When one part rejoices, we all rejoice. Help us to feel one another's pain. Feel one another's joy. Help us to encourage and build one another up. Your word says in Matthew 25, because as surely as we've done it unto the very least of these, it's as if we're doing it unto you. So, Lord, help us to truly be a body of Christ. Help us to have that biblical unity. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. And as we're bowed in prayer, if there's someone that is not right with you, Lord, The good news is you might be a thousand steps away. It's only one step back. And we just want to add our prayers in this atmosphere in such a way that you will foster a heart to come back for anyone that needs to. If there's anyone here who doesn't know you, maybe they know all about you. They can quote chapter and verse, but they don't really know you personally. And they want to. Lord, would you give them the courage just to surrender? That's what salvation is, to surrender, to open up their heart, to let you be Lord in every area. And your word says that you're able to forgive sin if we ask to make us into a new creation, to give meaning and purpose and direction. And it doesn't get any better than that. So anyone that does that, Lord, we we just want to say praise you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name and all the people said, amen. I'm going to invite you to remain standing. We're going to sing a song called The Blessing. It's, it's taken from Scripture in the Old Testament. In fact, a lot of pastors use this as a benediction. 
um, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious. We're not going to sing the whole long version, but Katie, if you can come on up, where's Katie? Here she is. We're going to sing uh, this song, the Lord bless you. And we're also going to treat this as a blessing for the meal that's set before us. Just make sure uh, you leave me some of Clay Walker's cobbler, okay? No, I'm just kidding. It is good cobbler, though. Um, make sure before we uh, sing this to thank those that are in the kitchen right now preparing the food to be served. So the Lord bless you. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Remember to thank those that are preparing the food. And we have prayer over here to my right where Sherry is. So uh, let's have some fellowship. Amen. <laughs> 